The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 24 Quick Hands and Quicker Feet. In the midst of the clink of knives and the cackle of black toothed men and women, Janner heard a wonderful sound. It was a sound he had known as long as he could remember, one that never failed to bring a smile to his face and a warm fire to his belly. Hodo was laughing. His laugh was like the sound of trees bending in the wind, the bubbling of a river where the windmill wheel spins. All the tension in Janner's neck and face eased away, and he laughed too. Lily giggled. Naya glared at her father. And what is so funny? Odo struggled to control himself. I just wanted to thank you all. You have been very kind and generous. Everyone, Strander and Igby alike, was confused. What are ye blabbering about, old man? said Claxton. Odo breathed out the last of his mirth, then looked into Claxton's face and arched a bushy white eyebrow. I said I wanted to thank you all. Your generosity is very great. It's so thoughtful of you to weigh me down so that me trip to the river bottom is as swift as possible. Didn't know Scranders had it in them to have such compassion on those they mean to murder. Poto winked at Janner, then reached inside his shirt and removed an iron cup. He dangled it from his finger, and the way the Strander's eyes followed its motion back and forth as they struggled to understand struck Janner as one of the funniest things he'd ever seen. He snorted and covered his mouth. That's me cup, said an old man in the back. Is it? Poto reached into his shirt again and removed a shiny dagger. Claxton snatched it away. Which one of you else does this belong to? A woman with a patch over one eye raised her hand, and Claxton hurled it to the ground at her feet. Poto reached into his shirt again, his eyes a twinkle, and removed a handful of coins, two green jeweled earrings, a bigger knife, a bracelet made of snail shells, and a toy boat. One of the children rushed forward and tore this last item from his hand. On and on this went, and just when Janner was sure Poto had no more folds in his clothes in which to conceal the things he had taken, out came another necklace or box of matches or an iron arrowhead. With each new revelation, the Stranders oohed and awed and gave Poto more and more of their respect. Even Claxton's face softened a little as he stood with his arms crossed, his eyes and Poto's still locked in contest. Finished, he asked. Poto made a show of patting his shirt and breeches, then nodded. Aye, that's it. Well then, this has been a fine display, Poto Helmer. It shows what fools inhabit the Strand. He glanced at the shamed faces of his clan. I must admit I'm inclined to believe he might have crept the Westrid out, and maybe even met Crowdfist himself. Janner smiled. Poto had clearly bested Claxton and shown himself worthy of the Strander's esteem, if not their friendship. But no man picked the pocket of Grolfus, the Strander King, Claxton said, his voice booming over the camp. And no man picked mine. Let your last breath be a drink of the river, and let me clan remember to keep watch when strangers enter the fold. Take the children to the cages and their keepers to their grave. The blood ran from Janner's face, but the Stranders hesitated. Murderers and thieves they may be, but they didn't like the idea of drowning such a one as Poto Helmer, who struck them as a Strander if ever there was one. Maybe we can just toss the woman and the round one in and let the peg leg live, Marley suggested. The Stranders nodded. Claxton's jaw clenched. He glared at the girl for a long moment and looked as though he might strike her, but he took a deep breath and said, that may sound like a good idea, but listen close. He may have a story or two in his pocket, but I can say he's too womanly sweet to these children in the mist. Picking pockets is easy, but his eyes ain't shadowy enough for our kind. And here on the Strand, we live by the shadows, clan. We roam the woods and slay fang and farmer. We steal and rove and let no man tell us where's where and what's what. We'll have no use for lying, old men, or their companions. Claxton knew how to stir the muck in the Stranders' hearts, and they jittered and hissed again. The children will keep, he said. 
But these three are only good for daggerfish food. I'm the head of this clan, and that's what I say. As one, the stranders leapt upon the old pirate. Poto fought, but they were too many, and he disappeared beneath a pile of swinging fists and kicking legs. They bound his arms with rope and stood him up again. Strings of white hair clung to his sweaty, angry, angry trembling face. It was hard to believe that only moments ago his rumbling laughter had filled the air. The stranders bound Naya and Oscar, both speechless, and Claxton nodded at Marley. She marched away with a shout, and the stranders pushed the adults out of the firelight and toward the river. Janner, Tink, and Lily watched in stunned silence as they were taken away. Wait! Janner pleaded. No! We just want to pass through! This isn't fair! He felt a blinding pain on the side of his face and found himself on the ground, blinking away tears. Quiet, boy, or I'll hit you again, Claxton muttered. As hard as he tried, Janner could think of no plan, no ideas that could stop what was happening. He wished Pete would come swooping in to save them, as he had done so many times before. He wished Nugget were still alive. Lying on the ground, Janner saw the hem of Lily's dress, orange in the glow of the fire. He saw the leather slipper on her good foot and the way her bad foot curled in on itself. The toe of the slipper rubbed bare where it dragged along the ground. Beyond Lily's feet, he saw Tink's, and his heart skipped a beat. Tink's toes wiggled inside his boots, and his right foot occasionally twisted back and forth in a way that made a circle in the dirt. Janner had seen his brother do this countless times, always just before he broke into a sprint during a Zibsby game or when they played ships and sharks with Poto. Tink was about to run. Tink was fast, of course, probably faster than any of the Stranders, but even if he managed to get away, he had nowhere to go. North was the barrier, south was the river, east was the dark sea. He might run west toward Dugtown, but he wouldn't last long without Poto, or Janner for that matter. What did he plan to do alone in the wilderness? Janner had to stop him. They stood a better chance together, and Poto and Naya had always urged the children to stay together at all costs. As usual, Janner fumed, thinking only of himself. Lily pulled Janner to his feet. You all right? I'm fine, he whispered, shaking his head clear of the pain from Claxton's blow. But I think Tink's about to... No! Janna tried to grab him, but it was too late. Tink broke away, bumped into Claxton, and leapt past the fire. Janna couldn't believe his little brother could be so selfish, so reckless. He wished he were free just so he could wrestle Tink to the ground and teach him a lesson with his fists. Would he re... Was he really going to leave them all behind? Coward! Janner screamed, aiming all his anger in his heart at his brother's back. It felt good to say it, and he hoped it echoed in Tink's ears with every step he took away from them. Before the word died away, and before Claxton and the Stranders had time to react, Tink sprang onto a bench on the far side of the circle and spun around. Stop! He yelled in a voice much deeper than usual. His eyes were wild with panic, shooting from Claxton to the Stranders to Naya and the others in the darkness beyond the firelight. For a moment, his eyes rested on Janner with a look of sadness and confusion. If, Tink said in a quavering voice, if you k kill them, you'll never... Never what? Claxton leapt across the fire in a whoosh of bright sparks and clutched the neck of Tink's shirt. Tink gulped and squinted one eye shut. I'll never what? Claxton repeated. I'm sick of all the talk and the stories and the threats. This is my clan. My bend in the river, and I'll draw my blade on whoever I want. D draw what blade? Tink asked with a smile that worked its way through all the terror on his face. What blade? Claxton narrowed his eyes. Why, this blade? He reached for his dagger and choked. This blade? Tink produced a dagger from his sleeve and held its point just below Claxton's ear. He gripped it with a steady hand and looked calmly into the big man's eyes. The Stranders gasped. Janner's jaw went slack. He had just called his brother a coward, and yet there he stood, face to face with a murderer. Janner wanted to hide his face in shame. He took Claxton's own blade, the Stranders said. That's not all, Tink said. He reached into his shirt and withdrew a tarnished medallion on a chain. It dangled from his fist and sparkled in the firelight. More gasps and murmurs issued from the stranders. 
The pwn! He took Claxton's pwn! Quick as a cat, Claxton twisted Tink's wrist so that he dropped the knife. He flung Tink, Tink to the ground, picked up the knife, and snapped it back into its sheath. And I'll have me medallion back, he said, snatching it away. He turned a nervous eye on his clan. Did you see that, Eastbenders? Never have I seen such grum in a boy. Picked me own pocket right here in front of me stranders. Now the way I see it, I could either flay him here and now and make an ally of a young man who may someday find great renown along the strand. I hate to put an end to such a promising future. He pulled Tink to his feet and clapped him on the back. Now how did the old man's story go? Let's see. He picked the golden bird from Grauf's pocket. Grauf is laughed and then, ah, yes. He struck Tink in the face so hard that the boy flew over the bench and landed in the shadows beyond it. Tink, Lily screamed. Claxton laughed darkly. Never try to game with Claxton Weaver, boy. Then something happened that would be talked about on the Strand for a hundred years. From where he lay in the shadows, Tink flung a dagger at Claxton, and the handle struck him on the back of the head. Janner didn't know how Tink had done it, but he'd stolen the dagger a second time. Claxton, with a look of great confusion and a knot sprouting on the back of his head, crumpled to the dirt, unconscious. The Stranders cheered and rushed to where Tink lay. They stood him up and brushed him off, chattering about his quick hands and quicker feet. Marley offered him a wad of damp cloth for his bloody lip and sat him on the bench. Me dad said that coming for a long time, she said, and she kissed Tink on the cheek. His ears turned red as sugar berries, and he grinned so wide that his cheeks struck, stuck that way for an hour. Naya, Oscar, and Poto were freed and ran back into the circle. They hugged the children and fussed over Tink, and Janner's stomach ached with the shame of what he had said, and even worse, of what he had thought. A bent old woman in a filthy dress pushed through the crowd and poked Tink in the belly with a cane. Her face was warty and caked with mud, and she wore her hair in a grimy bun on top of her head. The stranders fell silent. You've taken down Claxton Weaver, head of the East Bend, boy, she said. We were all growing weary of Claxton. The fool's me son, and that's all that's keeping him alive right now. You should know he'll be after ye when he wakes and aiming to kill. But don't fear. I have a mash of slug root that'll keep this old mud beard in bed for a few days at least. We stranders won't abide a clan leader dumb enough to let his dagger be swiped twice in one night. She whacked Claxton in the leg. If there's anything we in the Strand have always liked, it's a good tail and a quick hand. And you're so fast, even I didn't see you swipe the dagger that second time. Huh? Didn't have it for long, but he, the lad got his pwn, didn't he, clan? Hi, the Stranders cheered. What's your name? She asked. Kalmar, Ting straightened. Kalmar Wingfeather. Kalmar! The old woman said, and she spat. Huff. Well, then, you and yours will have no shelter, but the fire is yours if you like. Then she hobbled over to Poto and squinted up into his eyes. Poto Helmer, she said, jabbing him with the cane. You're not as handsome as you used to be, old man, but me heart is still yours if you'll have it. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson Book 2 North or Be Eaten Chapter 25 Tackle Ball in the Fog Nurgabog! Poto said flabbergasted. Aye, it's me! The old woman smiled and her leathery, wrinkled face creaked in protest. The stranders whispered and pointed like they were seeing some rare animal for the first time. I never thought I'd see ye again, but here ye stand, as ugly as a dead toad and not but one full leg. And still, I want to kiss you a thousand times. Nordicabog, dear, it's fine to see ye, uh, Poto said, backing up a little. Why didn't you say something when we first showed up? If you didn't plan to toss us in the river at all, we might have saved us a fat lot of worry. 
Ah, uh, let him tie up because half of my heart would be happy to see a thrashing in the blop where he's sick. You left me 55 years ago without a word, and that was when I still had me teeth, she sighed. But the half of me heart that still wants to smooch one out, I reckon. Thou wouldn't have let him kill me, sweet Podo. Thank you, Nurabog. You're as pretty as ever ye were, she answered with a whack of her cane. Don't you lie to me, old man. I've known I'm as ugly as a river weed. Now listen, we stranders of the East Bend will offer you a few days rest on account of Kalmar Wingfeather's quick hand and your fine looks 55 years ago. On one condition. Poto winced. I want one deep, satisfying kiss from your grizzled lips, Poto Helmer. Been waiting for it long enough. Nergabog hobbled forward, closed her eyes, puckered her lips, and waited. Poto took a deep breath, leaned closer, and gulped. It was like watching someone about to eat a rat. Stranders and Igbys alike stood wrapped in silence. Janner clamped his eyes shut and heard a long, wet kiss, then Nergabog's girlish sigh. The Stranders burst into applause as Nergabog trotted away. Poto wiped his mouth with his forearm and watched her go with a look of fondness, sadness, and nausea. The clan dispersed, nodding at Tink as they passed. They paid no more mind to the Igbies than to the dirt in their teeth. Tink swaggered over with a hand to the wound on the side of his head. Amazing, Janner said. That was amazing! Tink shrugged. Listen, Janner took his brother by the shoulders. I'm sorry. Sorry I called you a coward. Sorry I doubted you. Tink towed at the dirt, took a deep breath, and nodded. It's okay. The knot in Janner's stomach unraveled. He hugged Tink as tight as he could, and he didn't care that Tink was too shocked to hug him back. So how did you do it? Lily asked. How did you steal the poem? I noticed Grandpa slipping the coins and knives from the stranders as soon as we got here, Tink said. You can tell from the way their clothes hang whether there's anything touching tucked in there and if it's simple to snatch. It's easy, really. Ha! Poto said as he approached. Easy as picking a potato from the vine, ain't it, lad? I tried to get something from Claxton but couldn't get close enough to him. Do you realize what you did back there, Tink? Picked the clan leader's pocket, he said. Aye, but you didn't just snog any old thing. You got his pwn. Do you know what that means? I guess not. Don't let it go to your head, but it means that for now you're the clan leader. The boss of this bend in the river, Poto beamed with pride. My grandson! Tink's face went pale. Oh no, do I have to do anything? What am I supposed to do? Not a thing, Poto chuckled. We'll be leaving soon enough and that'll choose another leader. Besides, a clan leader ain't in charge of anything. He does what he pleases, and the rest of the clan has to do what he pleases, too. Being a clan leader ain't about having a responsibility. It's about having none at all. Two stranders appeared and dropped the family's packs to the ground. Old Nergabog told us to put everything back, one of them said. Our thanks, Poto answered. The stranders left the Igbys free to sit around the fire and inspect their packs. Janner found his old book, his tinderbox and matches, his folding knife and his bow, his dried meat and mirror. As far as he could tell, his belongings were all accounted for. It's all here, Naya said. She turned to her father. You never told me you ran with the stranders. With the stranders. Why didn't you tell us? Tank asked. Because it's not something I'm proud of, Odo said. Just because it makes a good story. Doesn't mean I wouldn't go back and change it if I could. He looked at Naya. There's much I ain't told you, daughter, and much I don't mean to ever tell. With that, Poto lay down with his hands under his head and closed his eyes. And soon, beside a warm fire under the cool stars, they were all fast asleep. Janner woke in a world shrouded in fog. It draped the ground, creeping up from the river and collecting in eerie pools around tree trunks and depressions in the land, coursing between the rickety buildings that made up the settlement of the clan of the East Bend. 
The structures were made of planks and shutter boards, leftovers from the ravaging of Scree at the end of the Great War. They reminded Janner of Pete's treehouse, but unlike Pete's castle, these buildings were shabby and unkempt, constructed without imagination or care. Stranders slept in or near the shacks, nothing for their beds but dirt, no pillows but their dingy hair and dirty arms. Beneath the shacks, deeper in the fog, squatted the cages. Janner could see nothing inside them, and the iron gates hung open. The Strander children had been so timid when they approached the camp the night before. May we come near? The girl Marley had asked, and they hadn't approached until Claxton gave her permission. Why were the children so careful around the adults? And where were their parents? Then he realized Tink was gone. The rest of the company lay fast asleep by the ashes of the fire, but Tink was nowhere to be seen. Janner scrambled to his feet. In the trees to his left, he heard voices, then a giggle. Tink appeared out of the fog at a trot, holding a leather ball under his arm. Janner breathed a sigh of relief and waved. Tink waved back, put a finger to his lips, and vanished into the fog again. Janner tiptoed away from the fire and followed Tink into the fog. Before he had taken two steps, Marley materialized out of the mist like a ghost. Janner gasped and braced himself for a fight. The girl had a wild, mean look in her eyes. Out of the fog flew the ball Tink had been carrying. It smashed into the side of Marley's head, and she staggered sideways, scooped up the ball, and disappeared into the fog again, whispering, Calmar, I'll get you! You can't outsmart Marley Weaver! Janner shook his head in disbelief. Sounds of struggle came from the left, and he followed them through the fog until he found Tink and Marley tumbling around on the ground, struggling for the ball that lay just out of reach. Janner strolled over and picked up the leather ball and instantly found himself in the middle of the fight. Marley Weaver fought dirty. She clawed and hissed, snapped her teeth, and punched. She socked Janner in the gut, and he doubled over, gasping for air and angry she had turned a friendly game into a fight. But he wasn't in Glipwood anymore. This was the Strand, and if he didn't want to get a little hurt, then he shouldn't play. Neither of the Igby boys matched Marley for meanness, but they got used to dodging her attacks. The three played tackle ball until the fog lifted and the camp awoke. It was the most fun Janner and Tink had had since the last Zibsby game with the Blagus boys on the morning they explored Ankle Jelly Manor. Poto stoked the fire and prepared a breakfast of oatmeal and diggle strips. Janner plopped on the stump beside him, winded, wounded, and filthy from tackle ball. Good morning, Oscar said with a puff of his pipe. Janner's old book was open in the old man's lap, and beside him was a stump where a few pieces of parchment and an, ink and an ink bottle. I've been working on this since I woke. The language isn't so different from Old Hollish after all. Look! He held out a piece of parchment on which he had scribbled several lines. What does it say? Janner asked. A fine question, lad. A fine question. Oscar's face fell. I'll have to ask your mother. Can't remember much old Hollish other than the look of the letters. All I'm doing is sorting out the new letters from the ancient ones. Once I have a page finished, your mother and I will set to work translating it. Made a friend, have ye? Poto asked as Tink sprinted past the fire with Marley on his heels. I guess so, Janner said. Tink has, at least. Well, eat some breakfast and then tread on. Every day we're out here, the fongs have more time to widen the search. It's taken us longer to get to Dugtown than I thought it would, and the ice prairies aren't getting any closer. Lily and Naya returned from the river, their hair and faces dripping wet. The shoal was safe, then, asked Poto. No daggerfish, and it was right where your old sweetheart told us it was, Naya said. Poto rolled his eyes. Nurgabog gave me this. He held up Claxton's pwn medallion. Said if we ran into any more trouble from stranders between here and Dogtown, the pwn would give us safe passage. Claxton's a feared man, she says. Feared by everyone but Tink, Lily said. Die, lass! He did good last night, didn't he? Tink lurched past, hugging the ball to his chest, while Marley clung to his back and pounded on his ribs. If we don't run into any trouble, Poto said. We'll reach Dogtown by dark. Nurgabog told me where to find a river burrow. What's that? Jenner asked. A strander hideout. 
We can stay there while we make arrangements in Dogtown to get past the barrier and up to the ice prairies. The Stony Mountains will be too cold for fangs and too rugged for travelers. All we'll have to fend from will be the snick buzzards. And the abominables, Oscar said. Aye, and the abominables. They're a terrible breed, Oscar said. Nigh impossible to kill. I remember reading in Pembroke's Creaturepedia that... He broke off at a glance from Poto. Er, I'm sure we won't see any. Probably not real anyway. When the smell of oatmeal and diggle strips reached Tink's nose, he dropped the tackle ball without a word, plopped down at the fire, and smacked his lips. Boys, wash your hands, Naya said, and she told them how to find the safe shoal. The brothers squatted at the sandy shore and dipped their hands in the water. Before them, the mighty blap slipped past on its way to Fingap Falls. The opposite shore was lined with trees of Glipwood Forest. I like Marley a lot, Tink said. She's, uh, nice, I guess. A little rough, don't you think? Janner asked. Not that rough. They watched in silence for a moment. She told me I'd make a good strander, Tink said. Janner laughed. You'd make a terrible strander. You're too smart for them. Besides, you're no thief. You're no killer either. You're the High King of Anaria, remember? They walked back to the camp in silence. <laughs>